All right, so yeah, welcome everyone to this kind of final lecture um, I'm going to give on probabilistic programs. I uh, have had a really good time uh, lecturing here at OPLSS, and uh, you know, I hope you all enjoyed and learned something interesting, at least from, from some of these uh, lectures, um, and also from all the other great lectures that are also uh, giving, giving talks here. Uh, so this is roughly where we are. Um, we're sort of on day four. Uh, I'm going to spend probably most of today talking about this probabilistic separation logic that I started last time. And at the end, I'm going to touch a little bit on, if I have time, uh, on uh, reasoning about probabilistic higher order programs. So uh, functional program languages that have probabilistic sampling. Um, OK, so let's, let's get started. So just kind of dive in where we kind of left off last time. Um, we were talking about uh, this logic of bunch implications. Uh, and we were defining um, kind of when certain assertions were true. Uh, for certain distributions over memories. So for some distribution over memories, I want to define when is uh, this assertion true and when is this other assertion not true. Uh, this is kind of the first step that we need to kind of develop a program logic or a whore logic uh, because we want these assertions to be the pre and the post conditions uh, for our program logic. Uh, so the, these assertions have to describe program states, which because we're working with this transformer semantics we introduced last time, the program states are gonna be distributions over memories. Okay, so last time we saw a few of these kind of atomic formulas. Um, so just to review, uh, you know, e, e, e equals E prime, uh, for instance, you can think of like X equals 42. Uh, this is an assertion that holds in a distribution of memories uh, if all of the variables in this assertion are present in the distribution. And secondly, uh, E is always equal to E prime with probability one uh, in the distribution. So maybe X is always equal to 42 in this particular distribution. Um, we also have kind of formulas about distribution laws. So the square bracket E assertion here uh, says that this holds in a distribution if all of the variables uh, in this uh, assertion uh, are inside the distribution, they're described by the distribution. And we can also have another distribution law assertion called uniform that says uh, E is a uniformly distributed uh, expression uh, over some set S. So for instance, if S is the, the booleans, this says that E is a uniformly distributed Boolean. So with 50% uh, probability, it will be true. And with 50% probability, it will be false. OK, again, in some given distribution. So to kind of demonstrate uh, how this kind of works, uh, I just want to quickly walk through uh, one example assertion and show how the definitions we gave you know, right here and last time, uh, they let us uh, model some property about distribution. So. The distribution I'm going to consider is going to be a distribution over memories. And there's going to be two variables called x and y. And in this distribution, I'm going to call it mu, uh, x and y are going to be kind of independent and fair coin flips. right? So explicitly, the distribution is what I've written here. So uh, the probability of x being true and y being true is equal to 1 quarter. right? Because there's 1 half probability x is true times 1 half probability y is true. Okay, And so on for all the other combinations of x possible values of x and y. So x and y are both Booleans. Um, now, I want to claim that mu satisfies this assertion here, uh, uniform x star uniform y. OK, and so this kind of follows from the definitions we gave just now and also from last time. So I want to step through this quickly. So the first observation is that we can decompose mu into a product distribution. Okay, So I'm abusing notation a little bit here, but mu is going to be the independent, independent product of two distributions. I'm going to call it mu x and mu y. And mu x is going to be a distribution over just the x variable. And mu y is going to be a distribution over just the y variable. Right? So in mu x, uh, x has 50% chance of being true, which is here. And uh, x has 50% chance of being false, which is over here. Okay? And same with mu y, just talks about the variable y. Um, now, you know, abusing notation a little bit, uh, we can say that the distribution mu is going to be the independent product of mu x and mu y. Okay. So this kind of uh, shows that mu is going to be, uh, sorry, I think that the order is wrong here, but mu is kind of greater than mu x circle mu y, where the circle operation is the moderate operation we defined last time, because that was defined completely in, in terms of this independent product operation. Um, Right, so this is this follows from this. Now the next observation is that um, mu x satisfies uniform x and mu y satisfies uniform y. Right, so this is 
uh, this, this relation here says that kind of uniform X is true in the distribution mu X. And this, uh, this thing here says that, you know, uniform Y, this assertion is true in, in, in mu sub Y. And this is kind of by definition uh, of what we gave on the last slide. So for instance, uh, this uniform X holds in mu X, this is because in mu X, the probability of X is uh, being true is half and the probability of X being false is also half. So it's uniform over the booleans. And same with mu Y. Uh, so then by definition, uh, kind of combining kind of these highlighted pieces, um, we have um, mu uh, kind of uniform X star uniform Y uh, holds in mu. Does anyone have any questions about this, this example? Okay, so again, I haven't talked anything about programs yet. I'm just trying to show, given some distribution of memories, um, this kind of argument here shows that this assertion called uniform X star uniform Y holds in the distribution mu. Okay. Okay, so this is just kind of exercising definition. So along with the definition, we can kind of give some axioms about these assertions we've introduced, right? So uh, there's many axioms you could give um, that would be sound. So for instance, one here says that uh, if X is equal to Y and X is uniform, then Y is also uniform. Okay, so um, you might believe this is intuitively true, but kind of given the definitions we had before, you can prove that this assertion is valid in any uh, distribution over memories. Um, you can prove that this, this is actually true. Um, another kind of fun one goes for a uniformity and products. So let's suppose that X and Y are uniform and um, they are uh, connected by star. Okay, so this is kind of what we just showed in the previous slide. Um, then you can conclude that the pair XY is actually uniform over pairs of booleans. Okay, so uh, I think this is kind of an interesting axiom because it crucially relies on this star connective here. So it's really important that X and Y are independent. So if X and Y initially are not independent, then we cannot safely conclude that X and Y are gonna be uh, uniform over the pairs of booleans, right? Because for instance, if X is always equal to Y uh, and X is uniformly distributed and Y is also uniformly distributed, then if you look at the pair X, Y, you're not gonna get all four possible values of you know, true, 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 false, false, true, and false, false, right? You're always gonna get true, true, or false, false, but you'll never get kind of pairs where X and Y are different. So it won't be uniform over kind of this, these four values in bull cross bull. Okay, so this, this is really important here that this is an independent product or a separating conjunction. And uh, just to show some other kinds of uh, assertions you can give, this one is a bit more complicated. Um, I probably won't, I won't try to prove this right here. It's not hard to prove if uh, you're interested in unfolding definitions, uh, but this is a kind of assertion uh, that relates kind of uniformity, independence, and exclusive or. Right? So here Z, X, and Y are all Booleans. And I'm saying, suppose that X is uniform and X is independent of Y. Okay, so Y can be distributed as any Boolean, okay? And furthermore, suppose that Z is equal to X, X or Y, so exclusive or Y. Then you can conclude that uh, Z is also uniform, first of all, and Z is independent of Y. Okay, so um, this is a little bit non-trivial, like, well, it's not immediately obvious because given this definition here that Z is equal to X, X or Y, you might expect there to be some dependence between Z and Y because Z is computed from taking X and then X or and Y. Uh, but this axiom is saying that if you know that X is uniform and it's independent of Y additionally, then it just so happens that in the result, Z is actually gonna be independent of Y. Yeah, again, um, if you're curious, you can kind of work this out by you know, doing kind of computing a distribution that has three Boolean variables, Z, X, and Y, uh, and trying to convince yourself, you know, there's only kind of a, what other, like eight possible uh, values uh, for these three variables, these this triple variables. You can try to convince yourself that no matter how you set this up, uh, if X is uniform and independent of Y initially, uh, and Z is X, X or Y, um, then the resulting Z will be independent of Y. Okay. okay. Any questions about this before I, I go on? So these are all you know, interesting things for you to try at home if you're interested in exploring this further. You can unfold the definition and try to do the calculation and see like it's, it's, it's satisfied. All right. 
So this kind of concludes what I want to say about the assertion logic. So, so far, we've just have assertions to describe distributions over states. But we want to get to a program logic, which lets us prove stuff about programs, not just distributions over members, right? Because uh, we're ultimately interested in proving stuff about programs. So here we get to the property separation logic. Um, the idea behind this logic is that just like any horse style logic, um, we're going to prove theorems or judgments of this form. They have this triple form where there's kind of this braces with a P, which is some assertion from probabilistic BI, this logic I just talked about. Then in the middle, there's gonna be a program C, which is uh, a P while program uh, with the transformer semantics. And the post condition is gonna be, you know, curly braces Q, where Q is another assertion uh, from probabilistic BI that I just introduced before. Okay, so again, um, you know, you think about P as a precondition that if initially the initial state satisfies P, then when you run C on the state, you'll get some final state that satisfies Q. Okay. So this is kind of definition of validity, uh, just kind of what I said. You know, so for any initial state, which is again a distribution of memories, um, if, if uh, S satisfies P or if kind of P uh, is true in S, uh, then the output state kind of transformed from, from C, uh, it will satisfy the post condition Q. Great. So this is just like any other Hoare logic. Uh, this is all kind of all kind of standard. Um, now I just want to quickly emphasize again that um, this kind of judgment that we're trying to prove perfectly fits the transformer semantics for P while, right? So under the transformer semantics, P and Q both describe a distribution over memories, um, and this is good because in this logic I just talked about, all of the assertions talk about distributions over memories, right? So there was no way to talk about just a single memory in this logic I've presented so far, right? You can only talk about a distribution of memories. So if I was using the monadic semantics, there would be a mismatch because the precondition P would try to talk about a distribution over memories, uh, but the input to a program would just be a single memory, okay? Uh, so that would not fit very well. Okay, so it's important here that we take this transformer semantics and it's important uh, because of the verification uh, technique we, we were trying to develop or the properties we're trying to prove. Okay, so how do we prove these judgments? So this is the validity judgment, you know, uh, for, you know, PCQ. Um, now, like any other Hoare logic, kind of proving validity directly is difficult, right? Because I have to unfold the definition of this semantics C as a function. And, you know, for loops, this is really complicated. You know, for if the analysis is really ugly, uh, it has this like splitting and combining stuff and it, it's really, really messy. Um, you know, proving this definition directly is really, really awkward. Okay, so it's very annoying. So like always, we want to find an easier way to prove these judgments. Um, so things that we want to have are we want to again have kind of compositional proofs, meaning we should be able to prove a property of a bigger pro program by building up uh, proofs of smaller parts of the program, kind of finding simpler ways to prove uh, simpler things in the program and piecing the results together. And the second thing we want, of course, we want to avoid unfolding the definition of the program semantics. So I don't want to ever have to look at the definition of semantics of C in order to prove something about this program. Okay, so, um, you know, when, when I prove that my, the logic is sound somehow, that, that my, my verification method is correct, I'm gonna have to unfold the definition of the program, but I just have to do that once. And when I'm using this logic to actually prove stuff about specific programs, I shouldn't have to look up the definition of the semantics of C in order to unfold it, because uh, that's very messy. Okay, so, Again, if you've seen this before, you know, bear with me for a bit, uh, but, you know, but the usual solution is that we want to define a set of proof rules, also called the proof system for this whole logic. And each proof rule looks something like this, right? So you have something above this horizontal line, kind of a bunch of judgments. Uh, this might be empty. There might be no judgments up there. You know, it might be trivially true. And below the line, we have the conclusion of the rule. Okay? And on the right, we typically write the name of the rule to make it easier to reference the rule. Um, and the proof rule, kind of can be read in two different ways. Reading kind of backwards, it says, you know, to prove the conclusion, you know, PCQ, uh, the thing below the line, uh, we just have to prove each of the things above the line. Okay, so we must prove, oops, there's a typo here, we must prove P1C, 1Q1, uh, all the way up to PNC and Q1. And the way, the reason this helps is that typically the programs C1 through CN are gonna be smaller or simpler than C. They're gonna be sub-programs of C, so you're kind of, you have to prove stuff about smaller parts of the program that are simpler, right? And in the base case, kind of when the C, C is a very simple program that can't be broken down further, 
uh, you will have a proof rule that has no premises where it kind of, uh, there's nothing that you need to prove uh, to apply the rule, okay? That's kind of the base case of the proof. All right, so I wanna kind of step through the proof system of PSL, uh, giving an idea of the basic rules. Um, there's no questions at this point. Um, I think I think there's uh, there's a question no, from Is there a cut rule? Uh, in is there a cut rule? I think so. Right, and so it's in some proof system, there's a kind of like a cut rule um, where you can prove an intermediate result and then substitute that proof into a larger proof. Um, here, I think in in most horror style logics, there isn't really a cut rule. I think of that form um, because you don't have any kind of hypothetical judgments. If that makes any sense. So all the judgments, sorry, all the premises we have here, um, you know, there's no hy hypothesis, right? It's not that assuming some triple holds, then another triple holds, right? You know, I, so it's not that I can prove intermediate triple and then use that proof as an assumption for another part. So in this kind of proof system, there's no hypothetical judgments, um, you know, so it's a very stripped down proof system that, that's very simplified. Okay. I see. Good question. All right. All right, so let's talk about the rules uh, quickly. So, uh, you know, typically you would present the rules one for each kind of program construct. So for assignments, you know, I'm gonna give a forward style rule. Uh, it's also possible to give a backward style rule, but let's just keep things a bit simpler. Um, assignment rule says that in any precondition, uh, you know, in any initial state, if I assign E to X, and furthermore, um, X doesn't appear in E, that at the end of the uh, program, I have X is equal to E. Okay, so it's this, this thing above the line is important because, you know, if you assign maybe x equal to x plus one, then I don't want to prove at the end that x equal to x plus one, because that wouldn't be sound. It it's, it's, cannot be the case that x is always equal to x plus one, uh, at least using a normal semantics. Okay, so this is like a forward rule that lets you add an assumption that x is equal to e. Okay, sampling rule is also pretty straightforward. I'll go ahead and do it in the forward style. So let's suppose that initial con condition is just any, any precondition. T, t means true. Uh, if I do a coin flip and store into x, then at the end of the program, I know that x is uniformly distributed along uh, according to a Boolean. Okay, so this is, um, this is an assertion that talks about the final state of the, the memory after running this program. Okay. Again, hopefully probably pretty standard. Uh, the sequence rule, uh, in, in most horror logics, the sequence rule will look something like this. Um, you know, where I want to prove that, um, oh, here's written out kind of like this, but the idea is that I want to prove that if the initial state is P, then I, when I run C1 and C2, then I'll get something satisfying R, right? So to prove that, it suffices to prove that if the initial state is P and I run C1, I'll get something satisfying Q. And if the initial state is Q and I run C2, then I'll get something satisfying R. So there's this intermediate assertion Q um, that holds after C1, but before C2 runs. Okay, so if I can prove these two things and I can prove that sequentially composed, I'll, I'll have this. Okay. Um, I, there's I'll, a question about the previous slide uh, in, in where you say yes. X is equal to E and you, you make a comparison there. Uh, there's supposed to be a distribution over memories or? Yes, um, so this is still interpreted over, in a distribution over memories, right? So I quickly page back here um, to how we define this. Sorry, I'm going back kind of far. Oh. So here I said that E equals E prime holds in a distribution S if all this variable condition holds. And furthermore, E is equal to E prime with probability one, right? So whenever you sample a memory from the distribution, you will find the memory has X equal to E. Does that make sense? Was that clear for some? Um, okay. okay, I cool. guess so. Yeah, so all of these are interpreted in distributions. None of these are interpreted in single memories. Okay, so if you ask, if this assertion, assertion hold in a single memory, uh, the official answer is that it's not defined. Yeah, it's not defined and it's not a sensible question. These are all term, interpreted in terms of distributions. Okay, cool, so I'm gonna really jump forward. Okay, great, so we were kind of here. Okay, so I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about that conditional rule because this is kind of a complicated rule. Um, and again, like when I introduced, as you'll kind of see looking through this rule, it has a close relation with the semantics of conditionals, which we spent a bunch of time on last time. Okay, so again, I'll try to present this rule in a, in a few kind of tries that initially will not work, 
and then try to motivate how we can fix the rule uh, to get something that is, is more, more correct. Okay, so I didn't really say what it means for a rule to be correct or not, but intuitively uh, a rule is correct if assuming that all of the premises are valid, then the conclusion must also be valid, right? So you can only prove things that are valid or true, okay? Assuming all your, your premises are, are also valid or true. Okay, so here's maybe the first kind of rule you might try if you've seen core logic for, for non probabilistic programs before, for standard programs, you might try something like this, right? So, you know, I want to prove that precondition is P, if I do if E then C, L, C prime, then Q holds, right? So in standard whole logic, this would be the rule that you would use, right? So you would say initially, in the first branch, E is equal to true and P holds. Then when I run C, I'll get a state where Q holds. Okay. And in the second branch, you know, let's suppose that E is equal to false and P holds. Uh, then when I want run C prime, I'll get Q uh, holding at the end of the program. Okay, can anyone see a problem with this rule for probabilistic programs? Right, so it doesn't, so uh, I keep saying it doesn't work if E is uniformly distributed as a Boolean, right? So in fact, you know, it, whether it's uniformly distributed or not is not really the, the problem, right? The problem is that somehow I can't, well, it's a little tough to describe the problem, but one problem is that in the initial distribution, it's not the case that E must be true or E must be false across, over the whole distribution. Or I can have a distribution where there's some probability E is true and some probability E is false. Right. So let me try to do, kind of show you an example where this kind of doesn't work. So here is the one that, you know, using an example that kind of I gave. Um, let's suppose that E is uniformly distributed. Fine. Uh, and I have this if E then C L C prime. Uh, the post condition I put bottom. So bottom is not true in any distribution. So if I can prove this judgment, um, that that means that somehow the precondition must be impossible already. Like, uh, you know, there is no state satisfying the precondition. Um, but of course, there is a state satisfying a precondition, so this is be this this judgment here would not is not going to be valid. So, if I if I do something like this, right, um, I can actually apply this rule like this, and I can prove these two these two things here. Uh, so I think I, I should have been a bit more precise and put like maybe C and C prime are going to be uh, skip perhaps or something like this. Um, but the point is that I can prove these two premises because both of these premises here of the, you know, the preconditions of both premises are actually false, right? So uh, if E is uniformly distributed and E is always equal to true, this is a false assertion, right? This is never gonna hold in any distribution because if E is uniformly distributed then it cannot be true with 100% probability. And similarly, if E is uniformly distributed, uh, E cannot be equal to false with 100% probability. So again, this these two preconditions are false. Right, which means that I can prove like this judgment is valid and this judgment is valid. I'm saying that, you know, for any distribution satisfying, you know, this false precondition, if I run C, I will get a, um, a distribution satisfying false. Uh, and that's valid because there is no distribution satisfying the precondition here. And then similar to over here, All right? So both premises are, are valid, uh, but the conclusion uh, is not valid, right? Because now I can find some distribution that satisfies uniform E. And when I run if E then C L C prime, I'm gonna get some other distribution. And this distribution is supposed to satisfy false, but that's that's no distribution satisfies false, right? So the conclusion is not valid, okay? Does this example make sense? Um, so, so, so the, the false here you denote with the bottom symbol, sometimes yeah. this is used for independence in, uh, in group conditional independence in sure. um, probability. Uh, but I guess, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's a fortunate, unfortunate notation clash. So here, the bottom I use will always mean false, uh, the logical false, not the Boolean false, like equal to true or false. I'm saying this is the, this is the assertion that never holds on any distribution. It's, it's, it's never holds. Like if you ask, does this, does false hold on this distribution? The always, answer is always gonna be no, okay, by definition. Similarly, top 
or true is the, this assertion that always holds in every distribution. It's always true on every distribution. Okay, so this doesn't quite work. So what can we do? So, okay, fine. So what went wrong with this rule where kind of the, the thing that went wrong is the, the thing that kind of causes a lot of grief last time in the conditional semantics, which is that uh, when we go from the initial distribution to the distributions for the branches, we have the condition on the initial distribution. Okay, so kind of in this conclusion here, we assume that P holds on the input distribution. I'm gonna call it mu. Now the inputs to the branches are, is gonna be mu conditioned on E equals true and mu conditioned on E equals false. Okay, so one thing you is generally good to know about conditioning is that conditioning can change a distribution arbitrarily somehow. So the fact that you know, P used to be true in mu uh, definitely does not guarantee that P is going to be true in mu condition on E equals true or mu condition on e equals false, right? So when I condition, I will get some distribution, but that distribution might not satisfy this, these preconditions, right? So then I, I can't apply what I know about C and C prime to conclude that what I get after is going to be something satisfying Q, okay? Because the condition distribution that are gonna be fed into the branches, they don't even satisfy the precondition. It, like P might not be true anymore. Okay, just like kind of uh, back here, P was gonna be uniform E, right? So when I condition on E being equal to true, then E is no longer gonna be uniform over the booleans. Right? It doesn't have 50% true and 50% false. It, it actually has 100% true now, right? So this assertion I used to know about the distribution is no longer valid anymore once I condition. Okay. okay. So that's, you know, that's the first problem. So to fix this problem, um, we're going to start using this separating conjunction, this star thing. Okay, so here's my kind of second try, kind of fixed rule. Okay, so here I'm gonna assume that in the precondition to the if then else, the guard is gonna be independent of P. Okay, so P is gonna describe some of the variables, um, but all of these variables are gonna be probabilistically independent of all of the variables in E. So the idea now is that when I condition on E being true or E being false, I will again move to the conditional distribution, but the part of the distribution that P talks about is independent, so it will not be, not be affected at all. Okay, so then I know that once I condition, um, the conditional distribution P is still gonna be true on that piece of the distribution because it's not affected because it's independent of E, because I have this separating star. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, intuition behind this kind of thing, right? So the previous count example kind of fails because if I took P to be kind of saying E is uniform, right? Then I have E is independent of E essentially. Uh, and this is a false assertion, right? This is not gonna hold in any distribution. So the precondition is never gonna hold. Uh, so then I can maybe prove that Q is false, uh, but the precondition is false. So I still have a valid judgment, right? This is still a valid thing to prove. Um, I haven't derived something that's impossible, okay? Any questions about the fix, the proposed fix. Okay, so however, if you've seen the name of the rule, you might infer that you know this is not actually going to work because this, this rule is still not going to be sound. So here's kind of another example that I'll, I'll give um, where I, I have this program that does if E, then assign E to X, else assign E to X. So this is the same thing as the program that just does assign E to X. Um, now I can choose, uh, you know, I can, I can choose stuff like this. Um, you know, I'll maybe kind of skip them just kind of quickly, but the premises are still gonna be valid. So in the, in the post condition here, it says that X and E are independent. Um, under the first condition, you know, E is always equal to true. So when I sign E to X, X is always gonna be equal to true, uh, but E and X are deterministic. They're always equal to true. Uh, so they are gonna be independent, that's okay. Um, similarly, in the false branch, uh, after running this command, X and E are also gonna be independent because they're both gonna be equal to false with 100%. So if I know one of them is false, I don't learn any new information about the other one because they're deterministically equal to false. Um, however, this, if I can prove this conclusion, it says that in any initial distribution, if I run you know, this if then else, I will have X to be independent of E. Uh, but that's kind of absurd because um, at the end, you know x is gonna be equal to e. So if e is initially randomized, um, then clearly x and e will not be independent. 
So I have again proven something that's not possible. That's not valid. I've proven a not valid judgment where I had a distribution satisfying the precondition, I ran the program, and I got something that did not satisfy the post condition. Okay. Okay. Right. So yeah, maybe I'll guess again, like, does anyone want to hazard a guess as to what is wrong with, with this? Why is there a problem with this, this proof? This one's a bit more complicated. So if no one guesses, I'm going to kind of just, just tell you the answer. This should be true as well. Sorry for the typos. This should be top. OK, so the problem, roughly speaking, is, is kind of mixing. OK, so like I said last time, when you have a if then else, the semantic says that you, you take input distribution, you condition into two pieces, the part where it's true, the guard is true, and part where the guard is false. And then I run them through the two branches, getting two output distributions. And then the final output distribution um, is that I combine these two distributions by mixing, mixing them together. Okay. Um, so the problem here is that, you know, given the, the premises, I know that after running the first branch, I have something satisfying Q. And after running the second branch, I have something satisfying Q also. But there's no guarantee that when I take the convex combination of these two distributions and mix them together, the blended result also satisfies Q. Okay. So it might be that I have these two things that satisfy Q and when I take a convex combination or average them together, I'll get something that no longer satisfies Q anymore. Okay, so that's kind of what happened in the, in the previous example. Okay. Right, there's some questions in the chat about, you know, E should not appear in C. So I think it's not, it, it's tricky to come up with a syntactic condition that makes, makes this rule okay. Um, okay, I'll, I'll still continue. OK, so this is the final fixed rule. This is this one actually works, I promise. Um, essentially, it's kind of like the previous rule, except I'm adding this new condition that Q is closed under mixtures, or Q satisfies a CM property. Okay, So this is a property of, of an assertion that might hold for some assertions or not other assertions. OK, and then everything kind of, kind of works. Okay, so um, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the CM condition, because uh, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, what, what happens here is that an assertion Q is CM if, it, if, if it's kind of preserved under convex combinations, right? So if I have a distribution where Q is true and I have another distribution where Q is true, then if I blend these two distributions together using the convex combination operation, then Q is still gonna be true, okay? So some examples of CM assertions, um, you know, if, if X is equal to E, um, you know, uh, this is an assertion that is CM. You can unfold the definition and kind of convince yourself that it's going to be preserved in a convex combinations. Likewise, if I know that X is uniformly distributed in mu1, and I also know X is uniformly distributed in mu2, and I blend together mu1 and mu2, uh, then X is still going to be uniformly distributed in the result. Okay, so these are kind of good examples of valid post conditions that satisfy Q. You can also take the conjunction of any two CM assertions is also going to be CM, and you can have other, other stuff like this. So some examples of things that are not CM, one of the most notable ones is kind of separating stars. So if I know X and Y are independent in mu1, and I know X and Y are independent in mu2, um, then when I combine mu1, mu2 by a convex combination, it's not necessarily the case that X1, X, X1, uh, sorry, X and Y are gonna be independent. Okay, so this is kind of what broke down in the previous counterexample where I had two assertion that this independence assertion was true in both distributions, but when I blended, it was no longer independent anymore. Okay, so that was the problem. Uh, you can also find examples of uh, stuff like disjunctions uh, that are not CM. Uh, you might have uh, two things that you might take different disjuncts in the two distributions. When you blend them, there's no single disjunct that's always true in the whole thing. Okay, but, um, but these are just kind of, kind of a quick tour of kind of this, this CM properties. Okay, so I wanna give a quick example of using the conditional rule and I'll talk about the last rule of the system. Uh, so here is, is a simple program. Um, it looks a little bit like kind of a controlled not operation in, in quantum, but all of that doesn't really matter. So it just says, I'm gonna branch on X. Um, if X is true, I will store not Y into Z, else I'm gonna store Y into Z. Okay, so I'm either gonna flip Y and store into Z or I'm gonna store Y into Z directly. So using the conditional rule, this looks like a lot of stuff, but using the conditional rule, I can show that at the end of the program, supposing that X and Y are initially independent in the precondition, 
And if I run this program, then at the end of the program, Z is going to be uniform. Okay. So, you know, in the two branches, I stored different things into Z. Um, but because X is independent of Y, this is needed. Uh, in the output, I'm going to blend together two distributions on Z. Uh, and they're both going to be uniform. So I'll get a uniform distribution on Z. And so this is just a very small example of kind of using independence um, assertions in the CM condition to talk about, you know, a branch. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. So the frame rule is the last rule I want to talk about. Um, for those of you that know something about separation logic, which I assume is maybe not so many of you. Um, so the frame rule is one of the, the, the most important or well, most well-known rules of separation logic for, for heap manipulating programs. And it says something roughly like this, right? So uh, in the premise, you say that I can prove that if P holds and I run C, then Q holds. Um, now, if I assume that C doesn't modify any of the variables inside this assertion R, then I can frame around this R assertion, right? So I'm saying that uh, if I have another part of the heap where R holds, but it's separate from the part where, where P is holding, uh, then when I, when I run C, um, I'll get the same post condition Q and I'll still have R holding on the rest of the heap because this part kind of C uh, did not touch. Okay. So this is kind of the so-called local reasoning principle in separation logic. Um, you know, you kind of only have to reason about the part of the memory that's used by C, the rest of the memory, um, you know, whatever complicated stuff, whatever complicated assertion is holding there, you don't have to worry about. Okay, so one thing that's quite subtle about separation logic is that this, this, this kind of seemingly natural rule uh, is no longer valid if you replace star by regular and. Okay, and this is roughly because you can have aliasing where two variables that have different names might be referring to the same piece of memory so when you think that you're not actually modifying um, that part of memory, you may be actually modifying a part of memory that another variable is trying to describe about or talk about. Okay. You might ruin some invariant from the, of another variable because you didn't know they were pointing at the same thing. This is not a problem in functional programming languages, right, obviously? Uh, this is not a problem in functional programming languages, yes. Right, yeah, you don't right. have aliasing. So all of separation logic was developed for imperative heat manipulating programs, um, or in general, programs where you have aliasing. Um, which might be, might be functional as well, but yeah. Great. Okay. Okay, so, you know, I'm just not gonna say, I'm gonna say, why is the frame rule important? You know, I'm just gonna skip over that mostly. Here, I'm gonna show the frame rule for PSL it looks rather uglier than what you have um, for regular separation logic. Uh, the first two things up here are already from re regular separation logic. So this one is from the regular rule that the variables in R uh, are not modified by C. So there's nothing, there's, these variables are uh, opposite. Um, the second one says that initial precondition P describes all the variables in C that might be read by C. Okay, so this is already a little bit different from the rule in the standard frame rule, which doesn't talk about variables that are read, right? Because in the usual frame rule, all, the, all that matters is that C doesn't modify variables that R, R talks about. But in this kind of frame rule that we have, it matters which of the variables um, that C is reading. Um, because roughly speaking, if you read some variable, you might incur a dependency on these variables. Uh, you might you know, make stuff that used to be independent no longer uh, dependent anymore. Uh, and this last condition says that everything in the post condition queue is freshly written or already described by P. Okay, so, so you know, this is definitely kind of fast and I'm kind of skipping over some of the details here. Uh, but all I want to kind of point out is that a frame-like rule that kind of looks like what you have in separation logic is also valid in probabilistic separation logic, where we change the meaning of star from heap separation to probabilistic independence. Okay, okay. so, you know, here you can, you can use, you can derive some, like you can derive a fancier sampling rule from the frame condition, um, but uh, I'm gonna kind of skip over this as well. Uh, soundness theorem, I'm also gonna skip over because I, I didn't mean to talk very much about this as well. Uh, I just want to show a very quick example of actually using this logic to verify something. So we already saw a smaller example before. Uh, I'm going to show another small example. Um, you know, in, in the original work we have on this, we have much larger examples, but uh, here's another example um, that, you know, tries to motivate some kind of security application for this logic, right? So what we're going to do is that we're going to verify security for a kind of one-time pad, which is the simplest possible encryption scheme. 
so I'm going to consider it to be even simpler because I will assume that the input message is a single Boolean because there's no difficulty to extend to you know, a bit string or whatever, but you know, why not just consider a single Boolean? So the input is a single Boolean. This is the, 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 the secret message. And the output is going to be a ciphertext, which would be another Boolean. I'm going to call it C. So the idea is I encrypt the secret message by drawing a random key uniformly called K and XORing K with M. Okay, that's going to be the, 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 the scramble version uh, of the message. Uh, and this is useful because you know you can decrypt by kind of XORing again with K that will remove uh, the, the key and you'll get back the original message. Okay, this is like the simplest possible encryption scheme. It's widely impractical for many reasons, uh, but just, I just want to show um, that you know we can we can do this. Okay, so this is this is our very small encoding program. It's even smaller than the program we saw before. Okay, so K is a is a flip, a uniform flip, and I compute this XOR and store it in C. Okay, so then to kind of Formalized security, there's at least two ways we can do it. So the first one we can do it is to show that the ciphertext is uniformly distributed. Okay, so why is this important? Well, it says that no matter what the secret message is as the input, the output is always gonna be uniformly distributed. So somehow looking at the output, even the distribution, you, you leak no information about what the message was because it's always gonna be the same distribution of outputs. It will always be uniform. Uh, a second one I think is also a second way of encoding security, I think is also kind of intuitive and nice is to what we call input output independence, where I assume that M is drawn from some unknown distribution. And I want to show that at the end of the program, the ciphertext and M are independent. Okay, so um, then kind of observing the ciphertext, the scramble version C gives you no information about M because they're completely independent. Okay, so we will prove the second one. Okay, so here's the program. You know, initially I'm going to assume that the input distribution has M. Okay. Uh, if I use a sampling command, um, I've drawn a fresh sample, uh, so K is uniform. And furthermore, using this fancier sampling rule, I know that K is independent of M because K is a fresh sample. Uh, if I use XOR, uh, I will have this that you know C is equal to K XOR M, and that can apply the XOR axiom to kind of conclude that M is independent of C. Okay, so this is this is indeed someone's mentioned in the chat that this is indeed the rule that we saw before, um, where this is the XOR axiom right here. Okay, so this is a very tiny example, just trying to show you how some of the rules work together. Um, we also have examples where we actually do use the conditional rule and all of that stuff, uh, but let's just give you a taste about how using independence um, can help you reason about probabilistic programs. Okay, any questions about the example before I, I move on? Okay, there's some, uh, I think, uh, some other questions about the frame rule about whether, uh, so there's a question that, uh, you know, for the frame rule, I said that if you replace the star by regular and, it will no longer be sound because of aliasing. So there's a question saying this is not tight in the sense that there might, there could be a valid derivation of that if R happens not to alias. Um, so the property of aliasing or not aliasing is something that you can't tell by looking at the syntax of the assertions in the program. So that's what makes this problem of aliasing so difficult, right? So looking at the assertion, you might think that one assertion does not alias another assertion, but you can't tell that, right? Like even if the two assertions mention completely different variables, it might happen that in the input state, these two completely different variables are actually holding the same address, right? So then they happen to alias, and there's no way you can tell that syntactically, right? So that that's what make, makes aliasing difficult to deal with and motivate a lot of this work on separation logic because you, you can't tell that things alias or don't alias by just looking at what the names of the variables are. Right, so figuring out whether P, uh, P and R is safe is undecidable. I don't know about undecidable here. Um, yeah, but it's, I'm, all, I'm only trying to say that figuring out whether things are aliasing or not is a, is a difficult problem. Um, this is rather challenging, um, you know, logically or complexity theoretically or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, I think it's a, yeah, it's a very nice piece of work on separation logic, uh, if you're curious more. Um, it's a lot of interesting, interesting stuff there. Okay, cool. So, you know, I have a bunch of references here. I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Um, the original paper on this transformer semantics was by Dexter Cozen. 
Um, it's worth reading. I think it's quite readable. He actually presents two semantics. So one is actually uh, an intentional semantics um, that I think we discussed um, you know, in, in comments before, where you have an input like a bit string into your program that represents a random sampling. Okay, so you can see the transformer semantics and also this other one um, that we don't have time to cover pretty much. Um, if you want to learn more about BI, a bunch of applications, this logic, I think the best reference I have, which is where I personally learned most of this stuff, is from Simon Doherty's thesis. Um, this is a recent thesis uh, where he gives a kind of a very unifying survey on uh, this logic BI. Uh, this is kind of a messy area because there's been a lot of work here and a lot of people taking slightly different definitions and stuff. Um, but I think Simon's work is really, really nice because it uh, gives a very clean and uniform presentation that is furthermore easy to extend to new applications, like kind of what we, we've been doing here. So there's more details about this PSL logic in our Popol 20 paper. And recently we have another paper that talks about conditional independence, um, extending this BI logic further um, in this LIX21 paper. Okay, and also a separation logic built on, on those assertions. Okay, cool. So I have about 45 minutes left, which is actually not bad. So the last part of this talk uh, and these lectures, I'm gonna be giving a brief view on kind of reasoning about policy programs in higher order languages. Okay, so, so, so far we've spent a lot of time thinking about imperative PYL programs. So, you know, we have assignments, sampling, sequencing, conditionals, and loops, okay? Uh, we talk about two semantics. So this monadic semantics, where the input is a single memory output distribution, and we talk about weakest pre-expectations uh, fitting the semantics. And the second part, we talk about transformer semantics, which uh, maps a distribution of memories to another distribution of memories. Okay? And when I introduced this kind of public separation logic, uh, I had to go quite fast in some parts, but I hope, you know, at least the general gist of the idea is, is kind of there. So what's missing from PYL? So, you know, the first thing is that you can only have first order programs. Uh, so namely, that means that you can't pass a function to another function and you don't even really have functions or procedures. Okay. So this being OPLSS, there's a very strong emphasis on kind of functional languages and higher order languages. So kind of where are the functions? You might wonder, you know, uh, are there probabilistic functional languages that you know we can we can define and define their semantics and things like this? Uh, and secondly, you might wonder like how do we reason about these functional programming languages, right? So the, the main tool, or maybe the most well-known tool for proving stuff about functional languages, is type systems. So what do the type systems look like for probabilistic uh, functional languages? So I want to kind of give an overview of some of this stuff. Uh, this is again a very big research area that I don't have hope to have the time to cover in in forty five minutes. 40 minutes. Um, so I'll be skipping over a lot of stuff and only providing a few examples. Um, but I hope to give you at least pointers or a rough idea of, uh, the, let's say, the, the lay of the land. OK, so the simplest way to design a functional language with probabilities is by using the probability monad. OK, this here, we're really using the monad uh, as in the monadic type. So we want to have a type that's you know distribution over t something. Okay, so I had some review about monads about, you know, for a monad, you have kind of two operations. You have this unit operation that takes an element of a set and takes it to a distribution over the set. This kind of says, you know, if, if little a is an element of big A, then unit of little a uh, is the, what I'm gonna call, I'm gonna continue calling that direct di distribution at a. So it's, it always returns a with probability one and returns anything else with zero. Okay, so this is the unit or the return of the distribution monad for those of you that are familiar with Haskell. Uh, so the second operation we have is bind. Um, you know, this is, again, with this kind of a sequencing kind of construction. So if I have a distribution over A's and I have a function that maps A's to distribution over B's, I can combine these two bits together into a single distribution over B's, which intuitively samples from A and applies F to get a distribution over B's. Okay, so this is the bind of the monad, um, again, uh, these are the second bit you need for, for a, mo a monad. And also all the, all the equational laws for a monad also hold, though I definitely won't be showing that here. Okay, so the first kind of probabilistic language uh, we're gonna see, I'm gonna introduce a kind of um, a probabilistic monadic lambda calculus. Um, this is maybe the cleanest way of introducing probabilities into a functional language, though there are some drawbacks that I'll maybe get to at the end. Um, okay, so the first layer is you have lambda calculus. Okay, I'm gonna assume this is most well known, um, but quickly you have, you have variables, you have lambda extractions, like uh, functions from variables to, to programs. 
you have application and you have say fixed points. So this is a recursive function definition. It's a definition of a recursive function. Um, I'm going to introduce a uh, uh, sorry, so these are, okay, so these are kind of Booleans and natural numbers, so I will say, you know, true and false are also terms in your language. I have, you know, if E, then E, else E, so this is another kind of if, then, else. Um, I'll have the number of numeric constants, and I'll have, say, I can add together two numeric constants. And finally, I'll have the probabilistic part, so this is the main part that distinguishes, so the, the stuff above, you will have uh, lambda calculus with recursion, uh, so this is something like PCF, maybe um, if you have heard of that before. But um, you know, with booleans and natural numbers, you have, you have that. Um, the probabilistic part uh, makes this language actually capable of talking about randomized programs. Okay, so I'm going to have kind of two uh, kind of distribution programs: flip and roll. So flip is just going to be the coin flip, fair coin flip, and roll is the fair dice roll. And I'm going to have two kind of constructs that are related to this unit and this bind operation on one that I talked about before. So there's return of, of uh, expression, and there's also sample x equals e in e. So this is kind of going to be the bind. So as I show you the typing rules, it might become clear about why this is bind. Okay. Um, any questions about this grammar? Uh, I'm going to show a few example programs in a second. But if there's any questions, I'm, I can take them now. Um, pr primitives, uh, do, you, do you have those in your, your language at all? Uh, uh, so you can think about stuff like add as being a primitive. Um, this is an op a function that takes two things and adds them together if they're numbers. So that could be considered a primitive. And of course, everything here is extensible. So you know, if you want to have lists or pairs or whatever, uh, you can add them onto your you know, expressions. So, so I'm, I'm not too particular on exactly what are the base types you have um, if you want to have, you know, integers that are, can be signed or whatever, you know, you can add another category here. That's, that's all fine. So, okay. okay. So it's kind of lambda calculus with base types and your base types can have various parameters that you throw in and this probabilistic part here. And again, you can extend this with other basic distributions if you want. If you want like a bias coin flip, you can add that in. That's, that's totally fine. Okay, so let's see a few examples of programs. So one of, our, one of our favorite programs is uh, sampling two dice rolls and then adding the numbers together. Okay, so it looks something like this. So sample x equals rolls intuitively says roll dice and store it in x, though you're not really storing because this is a functional programming language. Um, and then roll another dice and bind it to y. And then I'm going to add together x and y. And now it's important that I wrap this uh, with the return. Okay, that converts this thing here, which is a number, uh, into a distribution over numbers. Okay, so this will, uh, if you have kind of programmed in Haskell before, you've seen Monas before, this is probably quite quite natural. Um, or you can kind of think about this is this is kind of some do notation thing, and you have to use return at the end to kind kind of get it back into the monad. Um, but if you haven't, you know. Uh, you're converting a thing that is a number into a distribution on numbers because you want to eventually produce a distribution on things. Okay, so this, this program is not going to produce you know, a number deterministically. It's going to produce a distribution over numbers. Uh, slightly more interesting example is this example that kind of generates something from the geometric distribution. So this one um, actually uses the recursive uh, function. Um, so this is a recursive function um, that you know, defines it will take in a number, it will flip a coin, this biased coin, and see if you stop or not. If you stop, you immediately break out of the loop uh, or return from the function, let's say, I'm mixing the metaphors, you, you break out of the, the function and return the number that you passed in. Otherwise, you recursively call the function uh, on a number that's one bigger. Okay, so, um, and then the zero here is the initial value where, of where you start from. Okay, so, this is kind of a funny function because if you look at it, it doesn't really have a, it's a recursive function, but it doesn't really have a base case, right? So we would expect that, you know, when you do a recursive function, something is going to be decreasing. And once you, you know, reach zero or whatever, you, you, you exit, you have a base case. Um, and this kind of function, there's not really a base case. And like, furthermore, uh, you're, you're doing a recursive call on a number that's even bigger than what you were passed, right? So you go from, from n to n plus one. But the point is that this thing is going to terminate because at every iteration, you have some chance of just exiting. Uh, and you can show, or it is possible to show that 
this program is going to terminate with probability one, though it might take arbitrarily long for you to terminate. This is kind of a, it's a recursive function, but it's a, it's a weird uh, recursive function. Okay. okay. Uh, great. Okay. Sounds good. Any questions about this before I, I go on? Um, hey, could you could you have uh, a call inside of Flip to? I mean, I, I guess I probably could just look back at the grammar, but um, like, could could the the result of um, of of a Flip depend on a, a call to um, says a function inside your your language? Uh, that's a good question. So yeah, uh, it's a good thing that's look back at the grammar actually, because I think this is not even the grammar that I put. So uh, I have I have a slight inconsistency here. Um, you, it, it's possible to extend a language where this thing here, this one quarter, could be a program also. Okay. Uh, huh. It could be a program. Um, I think for the type system, it will get a little bit more complicated, but not much more complicated. The thing in here, the thing between the parentheses, the parameters to the distribution, um, they should be of base type. So they shouldn't be a distribution over something. They should be either they should be a number or something like that. They should be a, or a function perhaps, but they shouldn't be a distribution. Yeah, like like a first order thing. Like a, yeah, a first order thing. thing. Sure. Yeah. And uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. But pretend that I have this thing inside the grammar I just presented. Okay. So the operational semantics. Um, you know, I'm going to really gloss over this right now because I don't have time to talk over this very much. Um, I'll give some references at the end if you want to read more about this kind of language. Um, but the rough idea is that you can define uh, kind of operational semantics that takes kind of closed expressions to sub distributions on closed expressions, right? So I'm, I have some starting expression, which is closed, meaning all of the variables that I'm using are bound inside the term. And it will step to a sub distribution over a bunch of closed expressions in, in one step. Okay, so. I can define this thing, which I'm not, uh, I'm, I'll show a few cases maybe on the next slide, which says that a program E steps to mu, where mu is a distribution, is a sub distribution on expressions, it steps in one step. Um, and that by iterating this kind of thing, I can define kind of the multi step reduction where I say, um, you know, a program E steps, multi steps to a sub distribution on expressions mu in exactly n steps. Okay, so on values, let's say. So in this way, I can kind of define, you know, what are all the reductions that take exactly n steps to finish or n plus one steps and n plus two steps and kind of all of the things that E might step to are kind of the union of all of this, these, these multi-step reductions. Um, so I'll just show a few of the one-step reductions. Again, these are going to be mostly standard. This is going to be a call by value language. Um, oh, that's an extra error there. Sorry about that. Uh, so when I have an application, I apply a function to a value, I just substitute it into the expression and I wrap it in a unit to kind of convert it into a distribution. So this is an expression. When I put unit around it, it becomes a, distri a distribution over expressions. Okay. Um, true, like if then else is also, is also going to be standard. Um, uh, if I have if like true, then I step to E, right, a unit E, and if false, I step to the other branch, E prime. Fixed points, you know, you kind of kind of calling a recursive function, you enroll and you call and add, you know, when you're adding two numbers together, you just kind of return the number that you get by adding them together, something like this. Okay, and there are other other cases of this are, are, are pretty standard. Um, now for the probabilistic part, um, things are a bit more interesting. So for these two primitive distributions, flip and rule, I'm going to say that flip steps to this distribution over values, right? So this is a distribution that has one half chance of returning true and one half chance of returning false. Okay, so that's, I'm gonna say this symbol flip steps to this kind of distribution thing. And similarly roll, this distribution here is gonna to step to a distribution that has one sixth chance of returning one all the way up to six. Okay, so that, that's how these like, these primitive distributions are going to step just in one step. Um, and then you could define kind of the, the semantics for, you, for return and bind um, in kind of a straightforward way, right? So if, if E steps E prime, then return E is gonna to step to return E prime. Um, the most interesting example cases for bind um, 
which where it, things get a little bit more complicated, I'm going to say that you know, E is going to step to some distribution uh, over, over values. Um, now, if, if I sample X equals E and E prime, roughly speaking, this thing on the right is going to be the distribution I get uh, where like, I sample something from E uh, and I have, you know, it's probability P, I get, I get V. Uh, then I kind, kind of plug V into E prime uh, in the place of X. And then I kind of build this distribution here by weighting together these, these, these distributions. So all of the E primes here are actually going to be distributions. And this here is one big kind of convex combination of these distributions. Um, these are distributions over expressions or subdistributions over expressions. Okay. Any, any questions about this? Um, this is kind of the intuitive meaning of, you know, sampling something from E, calling it X, and then uh, evaluating E prime into a distribution. So I sample a value from E, I get a value V, say some number, and I plug this number into E prime, okay? This, this single number into E prime. And I'm gonna average over all the possible things I got out from E um, by weighting it with this, these PIs. Okay. So let's take a look, quick look at the type system. Um, so the main type system is going to be very similar to the type system for the, the simply type lambda calculus. You have you know, Booleans, natural numbers, functions. This, this is the first two lines here are going to be what you would have in the simply type lambda calculus. I'm going to add a new type, which is the distribution type. Right? So this big circle T means distributions over T. So I have a type of Booleans and I have a type of distributions over Booleans. You know, I have a type of natural numbers. I also have a type of distributions over natural numbers. Okay, so you can read this big circle as distribution if you like. Okay, well, otherwise you can you can you can have mix these. You can have functions that take distributions, return distributions. Uh, you can have higher order functions. So you can have a function that takes a function as an argument uh, or returns a function as 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 the result, uh, and so on and so forth. You can also have a question about distributions over functions. You can also have distributions over functions. That's also fine. All of this is allowed by the grammar. This is all fine. You can have distributions over distributions as well. That's that's also okay. Okay. So this this doesn't look like very much in this grammar of types, but it's actually quite uh, quite expressive. You can really talk about a lot of stuff here. Okay. Can you define so, new types? Sorry. Can you define new types besides boolean and uh, naturals? Yes, you can also put in new types besides Boolean naturals. Right. Um, you, know, you can toss in more types here if you want. Right. This language that we're presenting doesn't have a special feature for defining new types on the fly. Right. Um, but if you want new types built, because it's really a core language that we're using just right. to kind of study basic right. policy programs, not to be, it's not meant to be a program where a language where uh, practitioners or you know, people who actually want to write these programs can just define their new, new things. Um, but you can certainly add in, you can build in more kind of uh, built-in types if you want, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. You would need to add new programs and new terms and new constants for your constructors, for your new types and so on, but that, that's all, all okay. Okay, Okay. so typing judgments um, look something like this. So uh, you have uh, a close, sorry, this is not really a close expression. This should be any expression. Uh, e is an expression, tau is a type, and gamma is a finite list of bindings from variables to types. So you have these x1 is of type tau1, x2 is of type tau2, and so on. Uh, and then typing judgment looks like this, right? So gamma like shows that E has type tau. So this is the main typing judgment. Um, I think I, I like to read these judgments by also trying to understand what they mean intuitively, you know, independent of the, the, the soundness theorems and all of that, just try to remember, figure out like what exactly is this typing judgment supposed to guarantee? So the reading for this kind of judgment in this probabilistic monadic language is that if we substitute closed values v1 all the way to vn for these variables, x1, xn, then the result either reduces to unit v if tau is non-probabilistic, or e is going to reduce to a subdistribution over closed values if tau is probabilistic. Okay. So that is what this, this judgment means. So um, it's important to know that you know, these these things in the context, you know, if, if it says that, you know, X of type Boolean is in the context, that means that 
I get to substitute in some Boolean value that's going to be true or false for x. And then if I reduce e all the way down um, to a value, I'm going to get either a uh, theoretic distribution on a value if tau is not probabilistic, or I'm going to get a distribution over closed values. And furthermore, as I'm doing the reduction, I never hit a stuck term. So I never hit any runtime errors or some lot of add to Booleans or things like this. So this also does not happen. This is guaranteed by, by, the, by the typing judgment. So I want, it, I want this typing judgment to imply that. OK. So I'm going to take a brief look through the, the typing rules. Um, I'm assuming that most of you have seen something like this before. So I am going quite fast. If you have never seen this before, then this is likely to be rather unintelligible. Um, but I have to show you that it's all fairly standard for uh, standard kind of simply type lambda calculus, giving a type system like this. Um, this are the usual rules, right? So, um, you know, you have, a, you have rules for variables, lambda abstractions, application, and, and fixed points. Uh, these are four rules for those things. Um, you can also have kind of Booleans in natural numbers. Sure, you know, the true is of type Boolean and zero is of type natural number. Um, if you have two things of type natural number, you can add them together and that will still be something of type natural number. Um, this is hopefully not too surprising. Um, so before you get too far, um, maybe Alex has a question. He'd like to know um, whether a deterministic yes. expression can reduce to the zero measure? Uh, yeah, okay, that, that's actually a good question. I, I think I, I probably was a bit too fast in saying that uh, something would always return to re reduce the unit. So you definitely, this language has non-termination. You can have an expression that loops forever, right? So um, I think, yeah, yes, yes. So I think it's better stated that if, if, it if this reduction ever stops, um, it will get to, uh, I should really be careful what I'm saying here. Um, yeah, the short answer is you can have non-termination. Non That's definitely true. So I think stating exactly what the, the reading of the typing judgment is uh, requires a bit more care than what I did, I think. Yeah. But you can definitely have non-termination in the language. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Good question. Good catch. OK. Uh, so I'm going to spend a bit more time on the probabilistic parts of the language because these are the main new parts over simply typed lambda calculus. So for these two primitive distributions, flip and roll, I'm just going to say, you know, flip is a distribution over Booleans. So flip has type distribution over Booleans. Uh, roll has type distribution over natural numbers. Um, again, kind of following what we did before. Um, now the main two probabilistic constructs are these return and sample, right? So these are kind of the usual types you would have uh, for these monadic types. Right? So the first one says that if E has type tau, then return E has type distribution over tau. And that's kind of because this return construct takes something of a ground type and converts it into uh, something of a distribution over the ground type. So if you have a Boolean, I do return of the Boolean and I will get a distribution over Boolean that always returns that single thing with probability one. Um, the sampling rule in, is in some way kind of the, the heart of the whole system, of the whole type system, uh, and it's kind of the, the bind rule, uh, the bind of the monad in another disguise, right? So it's saying that if E is a distribution over taus, that's the first premise here. The second premise is that assuming X is of type tau, so not distribution over tau, it's of type ground type, uh, then E prime is a distribution over tau prime then sample x equals e in e prime is going to be of type distribution over tau prime. So again, I have a distribution over tau. I have the second judgment, which is you can kind of think as encoding a function from taus to distribution over tau prime. And then the sample contract combines these two pieces together into a single distribution over tau primes. So that's this is kind of the, the bind operation uh, of the monad. Okay. So I think Yes. Are there any questions about, about these rules? These are the, the more novel kind of type rules for the probabilistic parts of the language. Uh, yeah. Could you explain this bind rule again? Because it does E stand for, um, oh, I'm sorry. Should I just type the question? No, it's fine. Go ahead. Should E be a base type of type tau or should E be a distribution? Because so we are saying e... that X is equal to E and X is of type tau. Right, right. So the, the, I would try to ignore this notation here. So X is not going to be actually equal to E. I, I use the equal notation here. Uh, it's maybe not, not great. X and E 
here, you should think about it as having different types. So E is a distribution over something, and X is going to be of the bit of the ground type. So you can kind of see that E is a distribution over tau, and X is, a, is of type tau. So the, maybe the notation is not so great because it suggests that X and E are the same type, but they are not the same type. They're not. X is a small X is a is a instantiation of E, right? Small X. It's an instantiation. Yeah, it, it's like it's a not, sample you draw from E, right. let's say. So like, if you wanted to, you can kind of reuse the notation. I initially was going to reuse the notation I had before where I use that like arrow with a dollar sign over it that we use for sampling in the imperative language um, to, to, to say something like this. Uh, but yeah, so this notation is maybe not, not great, not great. Uh, other questions, Alex, there's a question about why does a single step of the operation center give a sub-distribution rather than a distribution? Um, yes, actually, I think you are right that it should give a really a proper distribution. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, some, some terms are not going to, so it, was, it still could be a partial operation, right? So some kind of terms are ill-typed and they will not step, right? But if a term steps, um, then it can, then it will step to a distribution. I guess there might be some example where you step to something that, um, you have some probability of stepping to something that is, is well-typed or not well-typed. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, maybe I won't try to get into that too much here because I'm, I'm not quite sure off the top of my head about the details there. Yeah, so yeah, David's right that this is like sample X from E and E prime. That's, that's the intended reading of, of this thing. Uh, okay, cool. Okay, so what do we, we want the types to ensure? So, you know, if, if E has kind of non probability of type, then we want E to reduce to unit of V uh, with, with type, of, uh, where V is a closed value of type tau, or E can loop forever, okay? And if probabilistic types, then, you know, if E is of probabilistic type, uh, you know, distribution over tau, then E should reduce to a sub-distribution over closed values um, where every single element in the support of mu, so everything that you can sample from mu eventually, also has type tau. So it's a distribution over, say, Booleans or a distribution over natural numbers or a distribution over functions or, or whatever. Uh, but they're always closed values of, of that type, of the same type uh, as it started with. Okay. So here I'm being quite sketchy, like uh, I think you just take my word for it that you can formalize all of this in a way that is quite similar to how you would normally do kind of progress and preservation for these type systems and proving soundness. Um, it's almost it's almost all the same. Just you just have probabilistic uh, values instead. Okay. So let me see. I've got about fifteen minutes. I think I want to say a little bit more about this kind of monadic style type system. Um, actually, I'm taking questions. Can we still work with discrete distributions now? I wonder if we can get some continuous distribution of function types. Um, like Nat, Nat Tabool with some suitable topology, right? So it's a good question about whether you can actually get um, like what kinds of programs you can generate with this kind of language. So here, I, I think I should be careful about what I say exactly because I'm not sure. I believe that in this program language that I've given here, you can only ever generate discrete distributions. Um, so distributions have countable support. Okay, so I believe that's the case. Um, you can certainly generate distributions that have infinite support, like this kind of fixed point, this geometric distribution I showed before. That program has some probability of returning zero or one or two or three or four or five, like arbitrarily large. Um, I don't believe you can generate a distribution here that has uh, uncountable support. Um, I don't believe that's possible. I think for that, you would need to have kind of primitive distributions that also already have uncountable support, like the Gaussian distribution as a built-in distribution. Uh, I believe with just flip and roll and these kind of finite or, or discrete distributions, you can't get there. Uh, but it's definitely not, not obvious. So I, I could be wrong about that. So don't, don't believe that 100%. <laughs> uh, that's definitely something that you would have to prove. And there's another world out there where you can try to define distributions um, over, uh, you know, using proper measure theory to try to define what it means to have distributions over an uncountable type or uncountable support. Um, 
that's uh, maybe I'll give some reference to that at the end of the lecture. Um, but that's also something that you could think about doing as well. Yeah, but we are trying to not do right now. Okay. So the intended reading of this like circle type, like circle tau is a, is a distribution over tau with countable support. That's the intended reading of this thing. It's not an arbitrary distribution or an arbitrary measure or whatever. It's really just a distribution with countable support over tau. Okay. So I wanna talk a little bit more about this kind of monadic style type system uh, to take a closer look. And then I, I think I'll probably just skip over the rest and just wrap up. Uh, there's not actually very much that I'm skipping. So one question that we have is that, okay, we have this built, this monadic type system that I've kind of sketched already. Uh, you can write probabilistic programs, uh, you can write recursive programs, and that's great. Um, but what are the properties you can actually prove using the types, right? So the kind of the properties you can prove using the types are currently fairly limited, right? So for instance, you know that if a program, the closed program E has type distribution over natural numbers, then I know kind of it will evaluate to a sub-distribution over natural numbers, right? So if, if I evaluate E to some distribution, I draw a sample, I'm always going to get some natural number, okay? So assuming the missing mass part, maybe it doesn't terminate, okay? Um, and furthermore, I know when the, when the program is evaluating, it never gets stuck, which means it never reaches like a runtime error or it tries to add two Booleans or, you know, call a, call, a, you know, call a if, do if then else of like a function or something, okay? So, I know it doesn't have this kind of error. Um, but kind of in the last two lectures, uh, or last three lectures, we, we introduced a lot of other properties about probabilistic programs that go way beyond this, right? So, you know, when I write a PYL program, I just, I don't just care that at the end of the program, you know, I get a distribution over in integers, right? I might care about the expected value. I might care about, you know, are these two things independent or not, right? Uh, I care about a lot of other properties besides like this program does not crash when I run it. That's like the, the bare minimum. And I might care about a lot of other interesting properties about a probabilistic program that you know, I want to actually analyze. Okay? And I might want to also analyze these things for a functional language, right? I also want to prove that my functional language you know, generates a distribution with this kind of a finer property besides just that it doesn't crash. Um, okay, so I want to kind of briefly sketch how you can extend this monadic style type system uh, to handle more properties. Um, at the same time, maybe this will kind of show some of the limitations of this kind of approach. Um, so in some ways, the like I said, the key typing rule in the whole system is this sampling rule, okay, which looks again, something like this. So to unpack this rule, I'm gonna say, you're assuming that first E is a distribution over tau. So I'm gonna say distribution or subdistribution. I'm gonna be kind of fuzzy on this. Um, okay. The second thing is uh, given a sample the second premise says that given a sample, uh, I'm going to call it X of type tau, E prime produces another distribution of type tau prime. Okay. So I have these two assumptions. And the conclusion is that if I sample from E and then plug the result into E prime, I'm going to get a distribution over tau prime. Okay, so these are the three pieces. Okay. Now, I might want to generalize this rule by changing the meaning of that distribution type, right? So let's suppose I replace the distribution by like type by something called P. Okay, this is another notation. I could have used square or whatever here. Um, so here I want this to mean E is a distribution over tau satisfying P, some property P. It, it, P is a property of some distributions. And the second thing says that given a sample X of type tau, E prime is going to produce a distribution over tau prime, and this distribution also satisfies P. Okay. And finally, I have this thing that if I sample from E and plug into E prime, I'm going to get a distribution over tau prime, and this thing is also going to satisfy P. So one natural question is that, you know, what kinds of properties P can I actually use this rule with, right? So some of the properties P, you know, this rule is not going to be sound, right? So um, you know, for what distribution properties is, is this okay? And if you've been kind of following along the last two lectures, this should remind you of something we've already seen before, um, that you need a special property of P in order for me to make this rule sound, okay? And the property we have is that we need a CM property again, that this property P should be closed under mixtures. And to see why that is, kind of what's happening is that 
we have a bunch of distributions over tau prime and each of these distributions satisfies P. That's this highlighted bit here. Uh, now we are gonna blend together all of these distributions uh, together into one big distribution, okay? So we want this resulting distribution to also satisfy P. So strictly speaking, this P here does not have to be the same thing as this P here, but um, this, this final P here must be closed under mixtures for this rule to be sound. Okay, so I have a bunch of distributions over tau prime. I blend them together. I want to get another distribution over tau prime that also satisfies P. And like we kind of argued, this is not true for all properties, right? It's only true for this class of CM properties. So for a some very small example, you know, I can try to give a monadic type for uniformity, right? So I can say like, maybe U tau is going to say that, say tau is a finite type, say the Booleans, this type says that this is a uniform distribution over tau. It's not just any distribution, it's actually uniform. And so it has equal probability of any, anything. So as we kind of talked about, this uniform property is closed under mixtures. So then the sampling rule here is gonna be actually okay. And again, this is unnecessarily restrictive. This U here can be another distribution type. Okay. But it's important that this U thing here, this is closed under mixtures. That makes this rule sound. If, if it's, if that thing is like, this kind of says that, you know, these are the kinds of properties, or this is a sufficient condition for the property to be able to encode it, to be encoded by this kind of type system, this monadic type system. If you want to talk about a property that is not closed under mixtures, uh, then you can't put it in the type like this, or like this type of rule will not be sound anymore. Okay, and that, that's gonna be bad, right, so. Um, Justin, I think we might have missed a question here as is, is there kind of some confusion about the denotational and operational semantics um, and the other things um, you know, keep reducing forever or they, um, the, there's a sub distribution there. Maybe you could comment on that. Right, so yeah, so it's a good question. I think I, I was going over the semantics very quickly. So I think, um, some of these things that I probably cannot quite explain here. Uh, for, for the geo program, you know, the idea is that you could define, you can define what is the subdistribution of everything that terminates after one iteration that, was, that kind of turns to a value in one step. Then what is the subdistribution of everything that terminates in two steps? Um, and then kind of the final distribution you get is kind of the union of all of these things. So the union of everything after terminating after one step, that's one subdistribution, and you have the uh, subdistribution everything terminating after two steps. That's another subdistribution, and you kind of add together all of these subdistributions to give the final uh, semantics that goes from initial program to distribution over values. Okay, so you can kind of do the same trick we did for the loop approximants to to put everything together. But I'll give a reference at, at the end of the lecture that maybe explains this stuff in, in more detail than I'm doing right now. <laughs> okay. So I just wanna comment quickly more about this kind of thing here, right? So I'm saying that if you want to capture a property of a distribution using this monadic-like type and you want to have this bind rule, um, then your property must be closed under mixtures, okay? And it's worth noting that try of comparing with what we had in the probability separation logic because there, there was also some rules that needed this closed under mixture property, right? But if you recall back there, the only rule, the most complicated rule that we had, the one that needed this closed under mixture property was the one where you have branching on randomized values, but you have if then else on a random value, okay? For sequencing, for sampling, for assignment, you know, uh, for everything else, there was no requirement that the assertions must be closed under mixtures, okay? But here in this kind of language, we're saying that if you want to have this bind rule, which is needed for any kind of random sampling in the whole probabilistic lambda calculus, then you automatically, your type must, you can only talk about stuff that's closed under mixtures. And this is, this is essentially saying that all of the assertions you could have in your, in your program must be closed under mixtures, which is kind of a limitation compared to what we have for imperative programs. And so that's, that's one reason why this monadic kind of typing system is very clean and very nice but it's kind of lacking in some respects because the, the properties you can talk about, almost all of them have to be of this specific closed under mixtures form, which means in, in, immediately you cannot talk about independence because it's not closed under mixtures. You know, your types can only talk about certain kinds of things now. Okay, so again, it's a trade-off because you, your language is richer, you can write more complicated programs, uh, but the kind of properties you can prove in the types are also more restricted. So I think that's the main thing I want to kind of comment on here uh, with this thing. Um, 
you know, I had a bit about talking about graded monads. This is the extension of monads. Uh, it's not so important. Those references here for those who are curious. Um, there's a little bit about, you know, people have explored type systems that are not based on monads because as I always say that, you know, this monadic type is a little bit restrictive, the kind of property you can prove or encode, you know, you might want to handle properties that are not closed under mixtures and then what do you do? Um, I think this is definitely an active area of research, people trying to develop types for this kind of stuff. Um, and um, I, I kind of quickly outlined two quick systems um, that take two different approaches. I think neither of them are like very satisfactory. They, they get a little bit closer and you can code maybe more properties, um, but it's still kind of definitely an active area of research. So more references, if you're curious, um, just quickly wrapping up, you know, this is kind of where we've been over the last uh, four days, more or less. Uh, we talked about probabilistic programs, motivating them. We talked about first order programs, uh, this monadic semantics and the pre-expectation calculus. We talk about transformer semantics for the for these imperative language and also the separation logic kind of style verification method. And I really briefly talked about higher order programs today and type systems for probabilistic programs. Um, I think there are kind of three main takeaways, at least in my mind. So the first one that it's, you know, if you learn nothing else from this course, I think at least take away these three things. The first one is that there are multiple semantics for publicity programs, and the choice of the semantics influences what verification is possible. Okay, so there's many different choices that are kind of equivalent in the end, uh, but cho the choice is important when you're developing a verification method. The second one is that uh, standard verification methods, I give you a kind of a brief tour of some of these things based on weakest pre expectations or separation logic, type systems, and monads. And the third point, uh, which is maybe uh, maybe a little more controversial, is that the verification is definitely currently better known or better developed for imperative programs than for higher order programs. I don't think this is an inherent limitation uh, of everything, uh, but given our current knowledge, imperative programs is definitely easier to verify. Um, where to go next? You know, there's a lot of stuff you can do. You could think uh, about more about semantics. Um, there's a lot of research on categorical semantics recently for these things. You can learn about conditioning, which is a huge area of policy program languages I just skipped over entirely. Um, you can think about verifying specific properties, like there's a lot of work on verifying like policy termination. Um, there's many different techniques that are known for the ter termination property. Um, lots of interesting applications like crypto, privacy, machine learning. And if you Look at just one thing I would say, there's a recent kind of book called Foundations of Probabilistic Programming. This is an open access book uh, that just came out, I think this year or last year. So it has 15 chapters by kind of leading researchers. So I contributed one chapter, part of one chapter. I highly encourage you to kind of take a look at this book um, because it has a wide variety of things, not just verification, also semantics, um, verification language design applications. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in here that represents um, a lot of what many people are working on in the community today. So definitely not all because it's a huge area now, uh, but it has a lot of recent stuff that's trying to be kind of a survey kind of book. So there's a link there uh, if you're curious. And I think this is all I kind of have. So thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, I had a lot of fun giving these lectures. Hope you learned something as well. Cool. Okay, Th thanks. This is really, really great. Um, thanks, Justin. Cool. Um, thanks a lot, Brendan, also for moderating. That's, it's been really helpful. Oh, my pleasure. Um, you should also mention um, Alex Lev and Chuta Sano and um, Will Smith. They were very active in answering um, questions on the chat. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. When I was could not figure out how to use the chat in the first few days while, while showing the slides. Um, cool. If there are there any other questions, uh, I can try to take them quickly now. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer more questions on Slack uh, as you think of them. I think I'll be around for. Uh, Few more minutes if there are any questions right now. I, I see that there are a few in, in the, the chat here now. Um, uh, I, I don't know, I could just go go through them chronologically. Um, are there type systems that you know of uh, that try to use fuzzy logic? Um, um, I don't know so much. I, I am, I'm not aware of any type systems that try to do this. Um, there might be some interesting connection there. I, I don't know of any work in that area. Hmm. Okay. Could be interesting. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's kind of a um, some yeah. So earlier there was there were some questions a little bit about c continuous distributions, and you kind of addressed those. M maybe um, so. So one thing I noticed that was absent in a lot of these was um, was floats, floating points, and something maybe that's not continuous um, exactly, but it maybe right. it, it has some some very large state space. Um, could you right. comment on um, for these these 
primitive types yep. that have very large state spaces, how, how you would go about doing that? Or is separation right. logic maybe not the right tool? That, I think that's a good question. I think you, all of this, the stuff I presented here, it doesn't really, it, it treats the base types as kind of just a primitive type, right? So, you know, it's the natural numbers, the Booleans, whatever, like it could be any finite set. Um, it could be the floating point numbers and, you know, you could have a floating point addition operation in your language and things like this. Um, from the type system perspective, it doesn't make so much of a difference because, um, you know, you're generally just saying, you know, this is a floating point number and that is not a floating point number. And, you know, I know I add two floating points, I get a floating point number. That, that's fine. Uh, if you want to do more verification, things get trickier, right? So I think you can find some of the difficulties are going to be like, for the separation logic, if you're going to make these axioms, um, uh, you know, this X or axiom or stuff like this, these will now be axioms about floating point things, for instance. And the axioms can be very ugly because uh, floating point numbers don't enjoy many of the properties that regular numbers do. Uh, it might not be commutative, it might be associative, and you have all sorts of weird stuff like that. So we we'll just make that part much more complicated. Um, it may make it so complicated that it's no longer feasible to use this kind of stuff. That's possible because it's the the you know the logical structure of floating point numbers is so 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 like awkward and has so many rules um, that it, it makes these assertions can be really complicated. Similarly, for like weakest pre-expectation calculus, you know you, you might imagine that in the sampling rule, perhaps uh, where we this kind of average thing, this weighted average of all the possible values, if you have to do all the math using floating point uh, precision. Uh, then definitely you're closer to kind of what the code is actually executing, which is great. Um, but these expectations you're going to compute are going to be much more complicated, right? So I would say that a lot of these techniques work better for kind of idealized programming languages that um, don't have, uh, say, floating point precision problems. I think for those, for more realistic languages, you would want to develop more specific tools that were designed for verifying specific properties of floating point and probabilistic programs. There, there, there's, it is an interesting point because these things can, can come back to bite people. So there's known examples of work in kind of differential privacy where people develop randomized programs to ensure privacy. And uh, people eventually found out or found out later that um, you know, the idealized version of the algorithm is totally fine. Um, but if you try to implement it on a floating point uh, computer, like any, any real computer, um, then the implementation can break the privacy guarantee. In, in a clear and unambiguous and serious way, right? So, you know, usually you would say this floating point precision stuff doesn't matter, but sometimes it definitely matters a lot. Um, it, it can really matter a lot. Uh, you can find attacks based on floating point precision on these probabilistic programs as well. So I think it is a, it's a very interesting, I, I, I think there's not much work done in this area so far for this combination of floating point and probabilistic programs. Um, okay, very it's interesting. Definitely not trivial. Yeah, yeah. Um... Okay, uh, and, and the next question here, um, does the magic wand have any use in probabilistic separation logic? Does the magic like wand have any use? Yeah, that's a good question. So in regular separation logic, people have found a lot of ingenious uses for magic wand. Um, this thing that's connective, I didn't really talk about this weird implication thing. Um, in probabilistic separation logic, we don't know so many uses of this thing. One use I think that we kind of found afterwards or someone, someone else found out she hadn't told us about uh, afterwards, um, is that you can use the magic wand operation to encode that a certain variable is deterministic. Okay, and this is not super obvious, so we didn't think about using magic wand like that. Um, but somehow the magic wand says that, uh, you know, if you extend the memory by an independent part, then some condition is going to hold. So there's some specific property of like deterministic memories that no matter what you extend it by, it was always going to be, you know, you'll always have independence, no matter what you extend it by. Um, but I'm being really fuzzy. I, I kind of forget the actual encoding. Um, there might be some other uses that we're not quite aware of, but definitely we don't quite know so many uses of magic wand so far. Hmm. Yeah, there might be some we just have not thought of. It's a weird, it's a weird implication thing. Okay, um, and uh, last question. I think we actually missed this. Um, uh, well, uh, Prasant asks, what are some other ways of developing a type system Aside from um, the monadic type system, I guess the second one you introduced and uh... right, right. So I think one of the things you can do is you can just say I'm going to make the monadic type and the base type the same type. Okay, so now when I see type boolean, 
I don't know it's going to be an actual a deterministic Boolean, right? It might, it's going to be a distribution over Booleans somehow, right? So you can just say that, you know, I de declare that this, this Boolean type is just going to stand for distribution over Booleans everywhere. Okay, so in this way, kind of, one thing you kind of lose is that you can no longer tell whether things are deterministic or randomized anymore. Like uh, the monadic one, you have this nice separation, you know, that if it's a non-distribution type, it represents a deterministic thing. If it's of distribution type, it represents a probabilistic thing. You have this clean separation. You can always tell by looking at the type, is it deterministic or probabilistic? Uh, you can just remove that distinction and just say, you know, this bool, bool means really distribution over Boolean. Um, that, that, that kind of removes the monadic part of the type system. Um, but the question of what kinds of properties you can actually verify in the type system are still not clear. So I think this is still an active area of research. Right, because somehow there's different systems. There's just two I outlined kind of, they differ in kind of when are you forced to sample, right? So in one of the systems, you're kind of forced to sample whenever you pass into a function. So whenever you pass an argument to a function, um, you're forced to draw a sample and then pass just that single sample into the function. Um, so with that kind of thing, you end up with, so kind of the function always ends up with just a single input, not a distribution. And so for instance, the, the function doesn't really receive a distribution as input. It receives just a single value. And then you're kind of at something that's kind of like the monadic semantics where you can't talk about distributions over the input to your function anymore because you only ever receive one specific input. You never receive a distribution. So that's, you know, you, know, you, you can remove the type distinction, um, but there's still some language design issues I think that are kind of unclear related to when do you force sampling. There's a second system that I was going to talk about where it's, it's called by name. So, you know, it's not called by value. So you can actually pass a distribution into a function. You can say like, oh, the function is now called by name or it's a lazy language. I can take a distribution over values as input and I don't want to see a specific value before I call my function. Um, but then, then you're called by name and then um, you still have to, you know, to, to, at least in the languages that have been considered to like, add two numbers, you still have to force the sampling, right? You have to say, I need to draw two samples and add them together. So I can control where I want to actually draw the samples from. Uh, so I think there's a lot of interesting, you know, trade-offs there. Um, I think the existing solutions are not super, uh, none of them has a sense that, you know, this is the, a good way to write probabilistic uh, functional languages. They have different trade-offs, I think, uh, but this is still a very active area of research. Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, maybe if there are any final questions, uh, you could unmute yourself um, yep. uh, and, and ask directly. Um, Otherwise, I'm happy to kind of answer more questions on Slack if you think of anything okay. else. Uh, and I'm sure these slides and then lectures will, uh, video will be up, up soon. All right. Um, yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks again so much. Yes. Uh, and, and I'll ask, I guess, everybody. Uh, unmute if they can, and a uh, round of applause for uh, Justin. Uh, thanks, thanks again. Justin. Thanks a lot, everyone, for attending the lectures. Uh, you know, thanks Jim and Paul and all the other organizers for, for organizing this as well. Uh, it's definitely not the same virtual, but I, I still enjoyed giving those lectures quite a lot. So thanks a lot, everyone. Yeah, and you know, on behalf on, of all of the organizers, Dana, Marco, and I, I just wanted to, you know, thank you for being here and giving these cool. wonderful lectures. Really, really happy to do that. Yeah. All right. And oh, wow. on behalf of all of us participating, I'd like to present you with this virtual certificate. Well, wow, virtual uh, for certificate. Our very real gratitude. Thank you for a wonderful and engaging lecture series. All and right. We started with probability theory, something I think a lot of us haven't touched in a very long time or really thought of as a PL concept, and got to see a, a whole bunch of really cool connections with monads and weakest preconditions and separation logic. And for those of us who knew about those, it was a great little tie-in. And for those of us who don't, I think we got to see some new areas of, and very interesting areas of PL. So thank you. Cool, awesome. Yeah, thanks Thanks a lot. Um, this is, a, yeah, it's a really, really an honor. And I'm, I'm really happy, you know, how many of you enjoy these lectures and got something out of it, whether the publishing side or the more traditional PL side, um, yeah. If nothing else, I hope it's you find the problem system is not so scary, hopefully. <laughs>